for a walk, okay? All right, here you go, Romeo. I decided to participate in the study because I'm a nurse myself and uh, I really believe in research and uh, there's a family history of Alzheimer's. I wanted to know my Alzheimer's risk because my grandmother, three aunts, and an uncle all had Alzheimer's. And so I was anxious to know if indeed I was going to get it also. The main idea for us uh, in conducting our research is to try to figure out uh, how people respond to genetic testing uh, for Alzheimer's disease. So uh, scientists have discovered a, a gene called apolipoprotein E where if you have one particular variant of this it elevates your chances of developing Alzheimer's in the future. But it's not, uh, this variant is neither necessary nor sufficient to cause the disease. Based on their uh, age, their gender, their genotype, ApoE genotype and family history, they were provided with a lifetime risk for developing Alzheimer's disease which was from birth to age 85 and then they were also provided with a remaining risk figure for developing Alzheimer's disease, which was their current age to age 85. The results were that I was already 75 years old. I was a white woman. My sister and my mother did not have Alzheimer's and I had none of the symptoms of Alzheimer's. So my risk factor was 16%. I had two of the genetic markers, E3 and E4. Mine was that I have one. When I found out what my results were, first of all, I was relieved because I only had one of the genes, not both. I did tell my husband, some of my other family members, and my very best friend. Just felt like, well, I know that. I wasn't surprised. <laughs> and I didn't worry about it or think about it a lot. What we found was that even the people who got you know, so-called bad news seemed to adjust relatively well to the information. They did not have increased depression or anxiety following testing. And in fact, a lot of them uh, found the information useful. They said it was helpful for them in thinking about future planning. Another interesting finding that uh, we had was even though uh, the information doesn't inform medical care, people were still using the information to take certain actions. So, for example, we found that the people who found they were E4 positive, i.e. higher risk, uh, were more likely to go out and purchase long-term care insurance after receiving this information. Come give me a hug. This is what Annie does at the hospital. I'm more aware now of the lifestyle behaviors. Um, I was already working out, trying to watch my weight. I take a cholesterol-lowering medication because high cholesterol also runs in my family, as well as heart disease. Uh, to say I'm perfect, <laughs> no, but I do, I try. Another thing that we found was that people were more likely, uh, if they were E4 positive, to report some kind of addition of a vitamin or nutritional supplement, even though there are none that have been proven to lower risk of Alzheimer's. But there's actually been you know, some talk in the media, maybe vitamin E is helpful, for example. So we found that a lot of people in our initial trials were reporting that they were adding vitamin E. It was interesting that people were, were you know, trying to seek some kind of control and resorting to to nutraceuticals that, that don't have any proven benefit at this point. Alzheimer's affects over five million people in the United States. So if you think about all the siblings or adult children of people with Alzheimer's that are out there, this is a, you know, a lot of people for whom this might be a very salient issue. Our research has suggested that people who are in their middle age as opposed to older age are, are, are highly interested. Maybe there's something about people who are in midlife or thinking about planning for the future. Or maybe the baby boomer cohort is you know, more information seeking. I would want to know the risk regardless of what it was because I'm a curious person and I am interested in my personal health. I have the attitude of being a lifelong learner. As new things come along, uh, I know that I'll be a person that can say, oh, okay, I know already. Um, yeah, I want to have that treatment so that I could prevent uh, myself from getting Alzheimer's. I want to live to be an alert and active older person.
This is Wendy calling from the University of Michigan, and I'm trying to... I think there are going to be more genetic tests that are going to become part of routine medical care, just like we've seen with some of the prenatal screening tests that are done, where a woman can have a blood sample drawn um, during, her, during pregnancy, and the results will tell her whether she's at an increased risk for having a child with a chromosome abnormality, such as Down syndrome, or neural tube defects, such as um, spina bifida. For example, too, testing people, what they call pharmacogenetic testing, being able to test someone to see whether the medications they could be taking, whether they have genetic markers or uh, depending on their genetic makeup, that, they, that the, re the medicine may not work for them. I think we will have the ability down the road to be able to test someone, say, okay, you've got hypertension, let's run this genetic test first. Okay, based on this result, this is the medicine that you should take. The controversy around uh, genetic testing, particularly of this type where there's no immediate medical benefit, and I think that's been the concern is, you know, it would be one thing if we could use APOE results to identify high-risk people and we say, here's this medication you can take, or we know for sure that uh, if you exercise more, you'll definitely lower your chance but we're not at that point yet so there's a little bit more of a question about what's the the benefit of getting this information so some people say we shouldn't be disclosing this if it doesn't have clinical utility but some people point to this concept of personal utility they say well it's uh, information is powerful I might be thinking about planning for the future retirement insurance planning uh, and some people are just very curious and they feel like if there's information out there and it's about their genome their body that they feel like they have a right to it. So it's kind of an interesting question that's uh, become, uh, I think, more relevant because we see some of these companies now that are emerging that are actually offering people the chance to learn about their genomic information. So I think we're going to have to do a really good job of educating both professionals and the public about, well, what's the meaning of this? Uh, what kind of information does it give us? What are the limitations of that information? And what does it mean in terms of you know steps people can take. So there's a lot of different health education challenges, which is interesting for me given I'm in a health education department. Uh, and I think this education has to occur at multiple levels.